to check their work. All right, the next question is actually a four-parter, all related to the Mark 139 eccentric mass vibrator. I'm gonna go ahead and ask them all and Paul can uh, answer them, I think, pretty quick. Uh, what's the total weight of the Mark 139 and can it be mobilized in a double car cabin? What's the maximum weight of the eccentric masses? Is the mass, weight, and speed, uh, can they be changed? So the vibration frequency can be adjusted to detect uh, its bridge structural resonance. And is this equipment available in Indonesia? What, in, uh, what institution has it? And uh, yeah, we mentioned it was being used for railway bridges. Okay. Um, we have many of these vibrators. Um, the Mark 139 is about a medium sized vibrator. And um, its total mass is about uh, 500 kilograms. But it can be broken up into smaller parts less than 100 kilograms. So it can be transported uh, in, a, in a small truck. Uh, you know, it's possible to do that. It's also uh, possible to transport it in a small aeroplane also. Um, the, the masses can be changed. Uh, you can subtract or add the masses so that you can go to different frequencies and get different forces. Uh, so it's fairly easy to change the masses um, in order to uh, uh, study an entire range of frequencies. This, this particular vibrator operates well between 1 hertz and 30 hertz. Um, the variable speed drive uh, that drives it is very accurate. It can um, control the frequency uh, of the vibrator to about one-tenth of a percent uh, over the 1 to 30 hertz range. And so you can take very fine frequency steps, and uh, it's all controlled by a computer, which also analyzes the data from the accelerometers um, and does a sweep. So you can identify the resonant frequencies of a bridge or any other structure. Um, and, and, and you can identify a resonant frequency even if it's only 1% uh, damped. Um, in terms of uh, vibrators, um, we, uh, in particular uh, at Anko, we have sold one vibrator to a um, company in Indonesia called Risen, R-I-Z-E, in a excuse me, R-I-S-E-N, and we are in the process of building a vibrator for a second company. Um, there, there may be other vibrators in Indonesia, but I do not know about them. Okay, Paul, uh, let's... Uh, could you please explain the servo actuator concept that we use in our shake tables? Okay, um, several hydraulic actuators, um, they're basically a piston, a double-ended piston. And there is a very high-performance servo valve attached to each side of the piston. Um, and this servo valve is under computer control. Uh, this servo valve operates, uh, can change the direction of the oil into the actuator uh, about 200 times a second can reverse it. And so by uh, reversing the oil flow in the actuator, you can make the actuator move in and out as you wish under computer control. Um, uh, the basic way it works is that uh, attached to the actuator is a displacement transducer. And there is a servo controller which looks at the command from the computer as to what kind of motion you want, sinusoid, random, earthquakes. And so the servo controller looks at that signal and then compares the, it looks at the actual position of the actuator from the displacement transducer. And it, turn, it instructs the valve 
to change the oil from the left side to the right side of the piston in order to get the same displacement. And it can do that you know, very quickly. And so these shake tables um, can easily follow a random time history, um, you know, at least to 30 or 40 hertz. And in some special shake tables, uh, it can follow it to 100 hertz and even more. So it is possible uh, to get the actuator to move uh, very accurately over a wide frequency range. And then you attach the actuator to the table and the table moves in the same way. Um, so you, you need the actuator, you need the high performance uh, servo valve, you need the servo controller, and also you need a hydraulic power supply. Um, on smaller shake tables, the hydraulic power supply only has to be uh, perhaps uh, 50 liters uh, per minute. Uh, on very large shake tables, you may need um, a hydraulic power supply that is able uh, to deliver 5,000 liters per minute. Uh, so it all depends on the, uh, the size and, and performance of the shake table. I, I hope that's clear enough, basically, on how it operates. Uh, could you tell us how to measure the response of a structure uh, while or after doing a shake table test? All right. Um, the most common way to measure the response of the structure is with accelerometers. There are several different kinds of accelerometers, but basically they're just very small um, mechanical parts about uh, one or two centimeters in size, and you put them on the structure, and you connect them with a cable uh, to a data acquisition system, and they produce a voltage proportional to the acceleration of the structure. So you can know how much the, uh, uh, the structure is vibrating in acceleration. Uh, you can double integrate that signal and then find out how much the displacement is. It's also possible to directly put a displacement transducer on the building and, and therefore directly measure displacement. Um, it's also possible to put strain gauges on the structure and so measure the strain in the structure. Uh, there are also other techniques where you can take a video of the structure vibrating and then you can analyze the video uh, at, at many points in the structure and determine what the displacement is. So, you know, there are many options for measuring the motion on the table. Uh, could you explain how you would, uh, how shake table could be used to model a dam against earthquake events? Well, uh, there are, uh, okay, obviously, you know, a shake table has a limited size. Uh, you know, dams are usually very large, a uh, hundred meters, perhaps more, uh, but you could always put a model on the shake table. And if you are not concerned with soil structure interaction, for example, if it was a, a dam in rock where there is not much soil structure interaction, then you don't have to worry about uh, doing it in a geocentrifuge. Uh, you can basically shake uh, the model of the dam uh, with the shake table, but it has to be a shake table that has much higher frequency capability because the scaling factors will mean that the model will have higher resonant frequencies than the real dam. But it is possible to do that. You can shake the model and then you can uh, translate that into what the real uh, size dam would do. Um, if, however, you know, the dam is very much affected by the soil, that it is in, then you either have to use a geocentrifuge shake table or you can put the model of the dam on a shake table and just be at 1G uh, earth gravity uh, and then you will get a certain response 
but it will not be accurate, but it will give you a case that you can check your computer program with. And, and then you, you, what you do is you, you use the table, uh, the 1G test on a table uh, to create data that you will check your computer program with. And then that computer program can say, okay, now that I know I am accurate, I can predict what the full size dam would do. So there's, there's you know different approaches that can be done, uh, you know, with with uh, with different accuracies. Uh, slightly related question: Could you tell us how to scale a structure that will be tested on a shake table? What is the experimental method and it? Its relationship to geometry scale, the strength scale, etc. Well, the, the slide, the, our second, no, our third from the last slide shows what some of these scaling parameters are. Again, it, there are different kinds of scaling, but the most popular one is this velocity scaling. And and you know, as it says in the slide, you have a scaling factor s. You know, so if s is a hundred, it means means that um, the, uh, the model is 100 times smaller than the real object, okay? So uh, in, in this application, you build your model 100 times smaller, okay? But because of the scaling laws, time changes by a factor of 100 uh, if you use the same material uh, as the real structure. So... The resonant frequencies of the model structure will be a hundred times larger than the real structure. Um, and um, then if you want to excite it on the shake table, in order to get the same strain in the structure, you have to shake it a hundred times the acceleration. Um, and so if you have a, a very, you know, if you have a small model, you're going to have to have a shake table that can go to much higher frequencies than normal, uh, perhaps 300 hertz. You also need a shake table that can go to much higher acceleration, perhaps 50 uh, Gs. Um, and then you can excite the model uh, and get the same strain uh, in the model um, uh, as the real structure, so that if that strain is going to break the real structure, you will also break the model structure. Um, so uh, you can do it, but uh, depending on the scale models that you do, uh, you, you need a, a special shape table. You know, it's somewhat easier, for example, if you were testing a, a model of a building and you could put a building on the shape table that is, say, one-fourth the size of the real one, then things are a little easier. Because it means that its resonant frequencies will be only four times higher. Uh, and, and that is uh, uh, easier to do. And you only need four times the acceleration. You know, by that I mean on a building with a scale factor of four, uh, let's say your earthquake is 0.25 G. Uh, well, then the model, you have to uh, accelerate at 1 G. And then you will get the strain, strain and breaking of the model as you would with the real structure. Um, again, this is a large subject. Send us an email, we can send you more information about it. All right, Paul, what would you do if you wanted to measure the characteristics of an aircraft engine and its propellers, uh, particularly they wanna find out the natural frequency? Oh boy, um, well, you know, fortunately, with an aircraft uh, engine, uh, you can probably use the full-size uh, aircraft engine. And, um, you know, what you can do is you can put accelerometers uh, on the aircraft engine and operate the engine and uh, perhaps sweep it through different frequencies uh, or different rotation rates. And then you can identify resonant frequencies. Um, the other thing you could do is you could use impact hammer testing um, where you have the accelerometers on the various parts of the engine and you strike 
uh, you use a small hammer uh, with a plastic uh, head and you strike the various parts of the engine and measure the resonant, uh, the vibration, which will tell you the resonant frequencies. Um, one place which is difficult, if you are interested, for example, in looking at the resonant frequency of the rotating blades, uh, obviously you can put an accelerometer on, but you cannot have a cable going to your data acquisition system. And so it, it, they do have accelerometers now, which are battery operated, and they communicate uh, with radio waves, you know, with the digital signals to the data acquisition system. So the accelerometer can be rotating with the blade and you can still measure uh, its signal without cables. So yes, you know, it, it is possible to do this with a variety of techniques. Again, if this is your interest, send us more information. We will send you more specific ideas. All right, let's talk a little more about the soil boxes. How would you fill it so it resembles the conditions in the field, especially regarding soil, water, and soil layers? Okay. Um, you do have to be careful. Uh, you cannot just throw the soil in um, because the way it settles, uh, it can be very different in, in the field. And, and the best way to do it is to um, have one of these soil robots, uh, which is basically just a box with the soil in it, with holes in it, and you slowly let the soil fall down into the soil box. And that is like the most natural deposition and gives the best results. If there are soil layers, different kinds of soil, you can do that. You can get the different kinds of soil and, and put it down in layers. Um, similarly, um, if the soil is saturated with water, you can add the water, um, uh, you know, doing it carefully, but you can add the water and, and, you know, pretty closely simulate what the real structure is like, uh, what the real soil and uh, structure uh, connection is like. You do have to be careful because if you are not careful, how you construct the soil, uh, you can get uh, errors in your analysis. All right. Uh, several questions about uh, offshore platforms. The first one says, uh, in the offshore northwest Java Sea, there are four platforms subsidence uniformly. Uh, how can we anticipate uh, that uh, something like the, uh, excuse me, sorry, I should have read this question ahead of time. Let's see, there's a lot of questions about offshore oil platforms, Paul. Can you describe some of your experience testing those? Sure. Um, I, I can talk about two kinds of tests, uh, one of which I have done and one of which I have read about. Um, you know, there is great concern about subsidence of offshore oil platforms uh, because the, uh, the soil under the water is uh, oh, very nonlinear and uh, very difficult to model. And so this is, uh, work has been done in geocentrifuges where, again, you get some of the soil from underneath um, and you, you actually create a box with the soil and the water, and then you, you, you bring over your, um, uh, your offshore platform that is perhaps floating, and then you let it drop into the soil. So you can simulate how the, the platform is moved into place and then dropped into the soil. And um, this gives fairly accurate answers as to whether the uh, platform will be stable uh, in the soil. Um, you can also, um, in, in case you don't drop the structure in, but are basically constructing it um, uh, in place, what you can do again is in a geocentrifuge, put uh, the constructed uh, tower in the soil, and then 
uh, you can use a um, uh, either a wave generator uh, or a pneumatic uh, actuator to simulate the effect of waves. So you can uh, push in a sinusoidal manner on the structure, or you can have actual water waves hitting the structure, and you can see if it is stable. Uh, you know, does it tilt over? Does it sink more? You can do this all in a geocentrifuge. So you know that is a good way if you have stability concerns with offshore oil platforms. Geocentrifuges are very helpful. Um, the other uh, way we have investigated um, uh, offshore oil platforms uh, is, is we can put in a centric mass vibrator on the platform and um, uh, do a vibration test to determine its uh, resonant frequencies and its damping. So again, this can be used to confirm um, the um, uh, finite element model. Is it accurate or does it need to be modified? And, and so uh, that's a good way of predicting uh, how it will respond to waves. Um, you, you know, you can, uh, you can get a validated finite element model, so you are more confident that it is predicting the right um, response to waves, the right fatigue into the joints of the structure. Uh, and, and so using this experimental information uh, can uh, you know greatly assist in uh, the accuracy of these calculations. Uh, there has also been some work done to monitor the response of all your platforms to actual wave action, and then um, calculate back uh, how much fatigue has gone into the structure. And so, uh, you you could, for example, have a system on an offshore platform, and it could report, um, uh, let's say, during a winter storm, how many fatigue cycles have gone into the elements of the structure, and therefore, do you have a problem? Do you have to do underwater inspection, and so forth? So, you know, there are ways that these experimental techniques can help with offshore oil uh, platforms. All right, we've only got you know, less than 10 minutes before we're uh, scheduled to end this session, but we'll try to answer a few more of the uh, quicker questions if we can. Paul, well, can you uh, briefly uh, say what percentage of accuracy is generated by the shaking table against field conditions? Okay. Um... I guess there's several ways to answer that question. Um, you know, if you are trying to say, I am shaking a piece of equipment, and how much, how realistic is that to field conditions? I, I, in general, it's pretty good. Uh, the only place you can get into trouble is on the anchorage. Uh, you have to closely simulate the anchorage of the field installation on the shake table. And sometimes it's easy to do, and sometimes it's more difficult. So for example, um, if, uh, if the equipment is mounted in a concrete uh, floor in the field, it may be a good idea to put a concrete floor on the shake table and anchor it in the same way. Uh, so you, know, you have to be careful to get the anchorage conditions right. And if you do that, you, you are pretty accurate. You know, I, I would say this is a very broad brush number. You know, you can predict the uh, experience of the equipment you know, to within 20 or 30% of what will happen in the real earthquake. Um, so, uh, you know, the same thing is if on a shake table or with a shaker, you are uh, trying to find the resonant frequencies of the structure, uh, you will often find that, uh, you know, the experimental value differs from the finite element value uh, by anywhere from, you know, 10 to 30 percent. Um, if, if you get it more accurate than 10 percent, you're doing a very good finite element model. But, uh, you know, this is the kind of differences you can see 
between a shake table and a structure in the field. Um, if you're looking at this modeling issue, testing models, again, if you're careful with the model scaling, construction, and anchorage, uh, you can get good results. You can, again, be within 30% of what really would happen in the field. Okay, I think we've got a few more quick ones here. Um, can the results of shake table tests be used in construction to overrule the practical code? Uh, well, that will depend a lot on the uh, the code writers. You know, on, you know, it depends if the uh, you know if the government or whoever is writing the codes, uh, the industry groups, you know, if they can agree on that it's okay. If they don't agree with it, then it's not okay. Um, you know, the place that, you know, sometimes it can help, uh, you know, for example, sometimes codes will say, uh, you must assume that the damping in this building is 3%. And if you do the analysis, perhaps that it is difficult to make the building work. But on the other hand, if you can go and you can measure the damping, and show that it's five percent and you can use that in analysis and and say look uh, i you know I, I in my structure i've shown that it's five percent and if i use five percent the building is okay uh, whereas if i use three percent it may not be okay and so in that sense you know it, it can in a sense not override but complement uh, local codes All right, I want to uh, ask this last question from my friend, Mr. Yadi at UGM. That's the example, one axis shake table we gave. He wants to know how a system with two multiple shake tables would operate. Um, how would the computer control of a dual shake table system work? And could a single axis shake table like the one at UGM be upgraded? or uh, modified to work in tandem with another shake table? Yes, um, you know, ANCO and other people have created uh, multiple shake tables that can be synchronized or move in different ways. So, uh, like for example, in testing piping systems or testing bridge models, um, it's a way of making two small tables act like a big table. So you can have two small tables separated by many meters, but the computer can synchronize them to move together or even to move differently to look at differential motion. And so, yes, you know, tables can be upgraded. You can have multiple tables. Uh, Anko once built a system with four synchronized tables for testing piping systems. Um, other people, uh, you know, have done similar things. So, yes. Synchronized tables, you know, can be built, uh, and and a single table can also be uh, added to another table, you know, to have two tables. All right. Well, we are very close to the uh, end here. Unfortunately, we have just too many questions to answer live right now. So I think we're uh, going to have to put a stop to the question and answer right now. I apologize if we did not answer your question, but please feel free to contact us or Zulfikri to uh, get more information. We'd be happy to speak to you about any of your uh, engineering needs. Uh, Paul, I, I would you like to say anything? If, if Zulfikri can send us the questions, um, and then we have the emails of everybody, we can write a little memorandum with the other questions, and we can provide in writing answers to those questions. Yeah, I will write it uh, and summarize everything and send to all of people. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for your time, Paul. Uh, okay. I would like to send greeting to to the 
the far uh, maybe uh, the far long long way from Jakarta uh, participant uh, from Papua Mr. Saul Ronsembre Pak Saul dari PUPR uh, di Papua uh, terima kasih dari teman-teman di seluruh Indonesia yang telah bergabung dari Papua juga dari Aceh juga uh, ini adalah webinar kita yang ketiga mudah-mudahan uh, kita bisa terus uh, lanjutkan di bulan ke depan dan seperti tadi yang disampaikan oleh uh, Paul dan uh, Boas bahwasanya uh, pertanyaan-pertanyaan ini kita akan jawab dan kalau ada pertanyaan silahkan kontak saya bisa lewat WA karena saya selalu WA Bapak Ibu semuanya nanti e, kalau ada yang butuh detail kebetulan e, engineering testindo lagi kurang sehat Pak Haitam Sungkar jadi dia bisa join e, kita akan e, bisa datang ke tempat Bapak Ibu atau kita buat sesi khusus jika e, ada kebutuhan detail atau detail tentang riset yang ingin didiskusikan e, kita juga uh, bisa mensupport di lain kesempatan burung darah cendrawasih da, cari dulu di Papua cukup sekian terima kasih semoga bermanfaat untuk semua uh, terima kasih thank you very much for you Paul and Boas and for all participant uh, uh, terima kasih banyak semuanya thank you also Thank you everyone for your time. We appreciate you coming to listen to us today. We look forward to hearing from you all again.